learning is a process. Within a lifetime, our beliefs, our perspectives evolve. I hope they do, at least. I know for a fact that many of us in this church have seen a great deal of evolution in our belief systems and in our values. I want you to think for a moment about something that you hold as compelling at this point in your life. Maybe it's a belief or maybe it's just a direction that you see your life going. Maybe it's a value. Something that you hold as compelling right now in your life. I'll give you just a moment to think about that. Now, you might have had a light bulb moment when your perspective changed, but it's more likely that lots of small moments led to your evolution when you think about it. Today, worship, of course, is focused on our relationship with the earth. And in just a bit, we'll vote on a covenant that is the product of the past year's congregational discernment. If we affirm the covenant, it will accompany our application to the United Church of Christ, and we will become a creation justice designated church in our denomination. Speaking for myself, just personally, I feel like I have fundamentally evolved in the past year in my understanding and embrace of caring for creation. But really, when I think about it, I've been evolving a lot longer than just a year. You see, when you're a minister who preaches regularly, you have the ability to document your beliefs because you write a sermon every week. And you can go through your computer for 30 years of sermons, and you can search for keywords like Earth Day sermons, or Creation Justice, or Genesis 1, and all of your sermons pop up and you can scan through them. And like most preachers I know, sometimes I read those old sermons and I think, dang, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and then other times it's more like, oh, no, no, that was not good. <laughs> My earliest Earth Day sermons tended toward appreciating the beauty of creation and praising God for it. And other than that, the role of humans was pretty passive. We were at the top of the hierarchy, and our job, as I saw it decades ago, was to say, look at this great gift, God, that you have given to us. Through the years... I sort of upped the game on the role of humanity in not only appreciating creation, but taking some action. So often I'd invite folks to get more involved, to do various things, you know, recycling, wash your clothes in cold water, carry a water bottle, stuff like that. All good stuff, of course. In 2011, my Earth Day sermon was titled, Domination, or dominion, not domination. God charged humankind, I said, not to dominate the world, but God had given humans dominion over it. At the time, I seem to have thought that that was a big distinction <laughs> between dominion and domination. I'm not too sure now. <laughs> I said in my sermon, when we think of domination, we think of autocratic rule of one thing over something else. But dominion has a different connotation. Dominion is the benevolent sovereignty of one thing over another. End quote. I'm not sure if I have to say end quote if I'm quoting myself, but <laughs> that's the end of what I said in 2011. And as I read it now, it sounds like splitting hairs. I mean, whether dominion or domination, the bottom line and that way of thinking, is that we're on top and out of the goodness of our hearts we may or of course, we may not care for the earth. And then I went through a stewardship phase, which basically still comes down to God wants me to take good care of what I have been given, what is mine, to do with as I choose. But God wants me to be faithful with it. And I've come to believe that all of those perspectives fall short. I really have Randy Woodley to thank for helping me to see a different way to understand the earth 
and its creatures. Randy Woodley, of course, is this year's speaker in the James W. White Lecture Series, which starts this Friday. He'll speak on Friday, Saturday. He'll preach next Sunday in worship. Many of us have read his books, and we're so excited to meet him, to learn from him. And quick plug, if you don't have your tickets yet, you'll still be able to purchase them after worship today. And today in the forum, which will be in the chapel, you will have the chance to hear from some folks with a preview of Randy's work. Randy Woodley, as we've heard, is Cherokee descendant, a recognized leader in the fields of indigenous and intercultural studies, ecology, spirituality, race, and theology. <clears throat> and part of his work is to invite indigenous and non-indigenous peoples to better understand indigenous worldview and practices so that we can all learn to walk on the earth, as he says, in a good way. In his book, Indigenous Theology and the Western Worldview, Woodley contrasts some of the assumptions behind Western religion and indigenous theology. He writes, this is how I understand the Western worldview. It has taken up too much space and it has insisted on its way in every single system that we have in education, in economics, the criminal justice system, and politics. That Western worldview says, we're doing this our way because we are right and everybody else has to come along or get run over. Do what we say or watch out. Generally speaking, he says, Western folks understand themselves as individuals who are distinct from the land. He says that beliefs tend to be central to Western folks, and religion is passed on primarily via correct doctrines, information, facts are what matter. Whereas indigenous folks, he writes, understand themselves as part of the land. He writes, we understand ourselves as primarily communal, and this is inclusive of the land. The land is understood as a part of the community. In an indigenous worldview, all of life is spiritual. There is no dualistic distinction. Individual beliefs are de-emphasized, he writes. Spirituality is passed on primarily not through books and lectures and orthodoxy, but through observation and participation and practices. Dr. Woodley identifies both as Christian and indigenous, and he points out that many, perhaps most, religions assert or at least imply that human beings are the pinnacle of the created order. It sounds like the creation stories in Genesis. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let humans have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Indigenous creation narratives, however, invariably reveal human beings as cooperative partners with the rest of creation. The hierarchy of humans at the top is missing from indigenous creation narratives. Now, we'll hear more about that next week from Woodley himself. The worldviews of Western people and indigenous people are very different, but the indigenous worldview is remarkably consistent with the biblical concept of shalom, of salvation, and of healing. Again and again in the Bible, God, the creator's desire for harmony, includes the whole community of creation, not just humanity. Not only does God create everything in the biblical tradition, but God yearns for shalom, for peace, 
for wholeness, for all that God has made. Humanity is one part of that creation. Humanity is a member of creation. Humanity is not the boss. Perhaps what makes humanity distinct, Woodley says, is that we are the only part of creation who makes a conscious decision either to help heal or to destroy the earth. The rest of creation understands interconnected reciprocal systems, and they do their parts automatically if we humans allow them to. Our modern lesson today is from Gus Speth, and it's included in your bulletin. Speth is an environmental lawyer, a scientist who has devoted his life to environmental justice. He's in his 80s now, and he wrote, I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation, and we scientists don't know how to do that. Scientists don't know about spiritual transformation, perhaps, but guess what? We do. We are in the business of transformation. And if humanity is to continue to be a member of this creation, we desperately need transformation soon. Creation will go on, with or without us. And that is why our creation justice covenant is so very important. It's a part of us stepping up as a church to come together to express our commitment to being a responsible member of creation. It shows that we are willing to do our part. Now, the covenant is printed in your bulletin, and I'd like for all of us to read it aloud together. In just a moment, we're going to be voting on whether to affirm this covenant, so it's important that we're familiar with what it says. So once you locate it in your bulletin, please read it aloud together. We, the members of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Colorado Springs, affirm our connections to God, one another, and the world around us. We all depend on our earthly home, yet there is an injustice in the distribution of environmental burdens and benefits brought about by factors such as race, class, and global inequality. We commit ourselves personally and collectively to confront the human abuses of creation, which increasingly cause human and other living species to suffer and many to die. We pledge to stay awake and aware of our responsibilities, to act in ways that protect, respect, and revere the earth and all living beings. Therefore, with God's help as individuals and as a congregation, we enter this creation justice covenant. This covenant 